Take your Bible while I'm doing this. Turn to Genesis 27. Genesis 27. Um, we are into Jacob and Esau and things related to them. Uh, as the story goes on, to me, it gets a lot more interesting. We're building up to, um, to something that, um, to me, it, it's just the gospel is what it is. It, it, you follow Genesis and you go from, from man, the fall of man, and God in the process of bringing salvation to people at different times. And it, it's, you have, you have it here in Genesis, God bringing it to Abraham. And then through his son Isaac, he says basically the same blessing that he gives to Abraham. And then from Isaac to Jacob, Esau's out of the picture. He's not, he's not giving that birthright to Esau. Uh, and he wants us to know why he's not doing it. And we'll get into all that. And then we get into after the after Jacob and the birth of the twelve sons and their one sister. I don't know if you knew that or not. They had one sister. Could you how would you ladies like to be the sister of twelve brothers? I don't I don't yeah, I don't know. I've never been a sister, so I wouldn't know any of it, but I'm not sure that would be a very favorable. However, she did have brothers fight for her when she got in trouble. That much we know. All right. <clears throat> and um, while I'm up here stammering, there is I've sort of mentioned a little of this. Um, I don't want to mention too much publicly, but <clears throat> there are there are a couple of uh, serious serious issues um, that are uh, that have taken sort of the front seat with me and uh, some people in this church and. Um, some people have been hurt bad and by evil people and um it it has it has affected me if you remember a couple sundays ago um i was just it, things were just going on i was just finding out about things that weekend and it was it was really shaking me and um, it still is. It's sort of on the forefront uh, of my mind and my heart. And um, I find myself just praying a lot uh, for some people. And um, God is a good God to us. And, but it... Sometimes it leads to the question of why does God let this happen? Why does God let bad things happen and so on? And um, the, only, the only answer that I can give people that is an absolute truth is what I have not only read and seen over and over in the scriptures, but what I know from my own life, that all things do work together for good. To them who love the Lord and to them who are the called according to his purpose. When we get to the story of Joseph, I'm going to, I'm going to spend some time with it. It's a wonderful story. And I'm going to be, I, I, I have said over and over that God does not gloss over the sins of anybody in this Bible. You can just pick a Bible character and usually find their sins. 
to me, so far, Joseph is an exception to that. I have not found where the... I mean, I know he was a sinner. He was born from Adam. Uh, but the Bible doesn't really point us in that direction with him. He is a type of the Savior Jesus Christ. And his life was pure innocence. Here he is at 17 years old, and all he's guilty of is being loved by his father. That's it. He hadn't done anything. He, and it, he can't help it that his dad loved him and made him this coat. And then his dad sent him, go find out where your brothers are. Find out what they're doing. Okay? And the older, the older siblings always hate when the little one comes up and says, what? Mom wants to know what you're doing. You know, they hate that kid. Yeah, so they hated him so much they were going to kill him that day. And he had done anything. Sell him into slavery. And even, even in slavery, God puts him in a wonderful position. If you're going to be a slave, the best one to be is the one in charge of the household. Because he is in charge of every. Thing. He gets to eat whatever he wants, and he's in charge of everything. Potiphar doesn't even know what he has, but, jo but Joseph does. And then he gets accused of something he didn't do, gets thrown in prison. But even in prison, God's using him to show the baker and the butler. And through that is when Pharaoh found out who Joseph was. Wait a minute, there's a guy that can read my dream? Go get him. Where is he? He's in prison. What do you do? We don't know. They pull him out of prison. And now all of a sudden, Joseph is the second most powerful man in the world next to Pharaoh. And really, if you want to get down to it, Pharaoh is Pharaoh in name only. The whole world is now in the hands of Joseph. He's in charge of everything. And he marries a Gentile wife, has two sons, and that, that's another story itself. But that's where we're headed. And you find these good things and these bad things happening to people in the Bible. And that's what I like about it. Because God then proves what he said. All things do work together for good. And by the end of Joseph. Here he is saying to his brethren, what you meant to me for evil, God meant to you for good. So he wasn't mad at him at all. Genesis 27. Um, part of this I know we've covered before. I just want to back up a little bit. We didn't have church last Sunday night. And um, uh, by this time last Sunday, I was stuck out on Highway 44 at mile marker 147. I had it memorized and because we had a blowout on the camper and the tire actually was coming apart and it busted some drains we had on there that I have no idea what they were for, but we'd lost water all week long, but we made it. So anyway, um, Genesis 27, let's start reading verse one. It came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, he said unto him, Behold, here am I. Uh, and he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, thy bow. Go out the field and take me some venison and make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. Now, one thing I wanted you to do was this. I wanted you to compare, and this was your homework. You had two weeks to do it. Compare Jacob's blessing to Esau's blessing. Okay? Compare those two blessings. And I don't know if I have them in my notes. I don't, but I'm going to draw your attention to, a, to another place in the Bible. Let's look at the wording of Jacob's blessing, and then we'll look at the wording of Esau's blessing, okay? Let's pray first. Father, we ask your blessings on tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your word and this Bible. And Lord, so many people 
distrust the Word of God, so many preachers overlooking what's, what's in this book, even things like this, they just, they just bypass. They think there's nothing there that's relevant in anybody's life, but there is. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would open our eyes to even greater things that are in this book that we know not. Lord, help us to never stop being a student of your word. Lord, may the day never come that while we're here on this earth that we stop learning from you and from the Holy Spirit and from the Bible. And Lord, just fill our minds with wisdom and goodness and bless this church, bless people, Lord, that really could use a blessing right now. Pray, dear God, that you would give them an abundance, Lord, give them overflow. And Lord, just use us as brothers and sisters to love one another, care for one another, pray for one another. Pray for those, Lord, who we don't want to pray for. Ask blessings and salvation upon people, Lord, that we may be upset with. I pray, dear God, that we would always have the right spirit about us. Just bless your people tonight. All of those with us online, all of those who could not be here, bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Now, I'm making a point here, and, and let me kind of just sort of get you into the mindset of where we're going. Years ago, when I, when I really started studying this, I started to see, and this is what I like about the Bible, I like to recognize patterns. When you see patterns, it's like, a, it's like an art expert who can look at a painting and tell you whether or not it's a real Rembrandt or it's a fake. And it's because they know Rembrandt and his brush strokes and things that he does and things that he doesn't do. He studied it all his life and he says, okay, this is genuine and this is a fake. This is a forgery here. And when you start reading the Bible and when you stick with the King James, it just becomes, the language becomes part of you and you start seeing patterns in the Bible because that's how God is. He's recognizable in the way that he does things. And um, God had always intended on saving two groups of people, two identifiable groups of people. And you see them uh, really in Revelation 7. You have the sealing of the 12,000 from each tribe of Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and those 12 sons, 12,000 from each one of those is sealed, and they're sealed in, in their foreheads with the seal of God, which is the Holy Spirit. It's the same seal that you and I have when we are truly born again. The Holy Ghost seal. God gives us that Holy Spirit of promise, which he says in Ephesians is the, um, it's the earnest of our inheritance. In other words, God's showing us a, a token and a sign that he really is going to keep his promise to us because he puts his spirit inside of us and we have the spirit in us and we, we when we read this Bible, God just shows us things and makes it plain to us, okay? So that's part of it. Then you have, in Revelation 7, you have the, the Gentile nations from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every color and type of people that are there. So... To all you racists out there, you skinheads and everybody else, I got no time for you, don't even want to talk to you because you don't know what this, you don't know what salvation is. You think it's only to a tribe. You've been around people that told you it's only for a certain group of people. It's the true Israel and the white cock. And I'm so sick of that. I've encountered that many times. But it's the, the tribes and the nations of people that are not the Jews. 
And God then offers salvation to everybody. And you see that. You see God deal with Israel all through the Old Testament. He long suffers with them. He finally has had it, writes them a bill of divorce, says we're, we're done with, we're over with. I'm going to go find a people that actually will listen to me, that will do what I ask them to do, that will receive my grace and my mercy. And I'll just pardon their sins. How's that? And they won't have to follow your law. And that's what happened. Here comes Jesus in the four Gospels. And the Holy Ghost then descends. And the dis disciples all start speaking these Gentile languages. And bada boom, that's a sign to Israel. God's, been, God's doing exactly what he said. He's, he's had the wedding party. He's invited the, the people. They decided not to come. So then he's going out in the highways and byways and said, Who wants to come to the wedding? And that's us today. So... When you go back and you look, in, especially in Genesis, you always had these two people. When Abraham was alive, it was Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was the firstborn son from Abraham's loins. There's no doubt about that. Isaac was born 13 years later. But Ishmael was born from a slave woman, a woman who didn't have a choice. She was a bondwoman, and there's no way, and it wasn't God who said that, that was Sarah, got Abraham in that trouble. And so Abram has Ishmael. And it's not, it's not the son that he promised. So then we have the second son, Isaac, who is the child of promise because he came from Sarah herself. The old Sarah, the old man who has inside of her the new man. That's the picture of it. Okay? And so God sends Hagar and Ishmael away. And he says, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And it's through Isaac that Jesus came, not Ishmael. But was there yet still a promise for Ishmael? Yes. A great nation. God said he'd make out of them. Twelve sons he has. And that number, that number signifies God's promise. Okay, there's no doubt about it. So, And then Paul uses that. And he says that Isaac represents those who are born of promise. And Ishmael represents those who were born. Hagar is Mount Sinai and is Jerusalem on the earth and is in bondage. So Hagar actually represents the Jews as they are now because they're in bondage. Isaac and Sarah represent those who are born again because of Jesus Christ through faith. So anybody, Jew or Gentile, who is born through faith by grace is born of Sarah represents Jerusalem up here. Hagar represents Jerusalem down here. Okay? So now you have Ishmael and Isaac. Then you have Isaac having his two sons. Esau and Jacob. Esau's firstborn. Obviously the firstborn. By rights, he should get the inheritance and the blessing. But remember, Esau has already sold his birthright. Anything he would have received in the will, he sold it for a supper, for one meal. Which is a picture of you and I and everybody else in this world who would sell God's everlasting promises of joys in heaven for eternity for one sin. And all of us did it. All of us did it. We sold eternity in heaven for one sin. Okay? All right. Anyway, um, so that's, that's that representation. Then Esau 
is called in by Jacob. Jacob says, go get me some venison. Bring it in like you used to. Bring me some savory meats. And when you come back, I'll bless you. Well, then Rebecca takes over. And she says, you cover yourself with fur. Slip in there. Here's some, here's some good savory meat. And daddy will eat it. And he'll feel you. And he'll smell you. And he'll think you're Esau. And he'll bless you. Okay? And that's what happens here. Okay? And clearly then, you look in places in the Bible, and we're going to see those tonight, that God just, e Esau, I'm done with you. I rejected you. Boom, you're out. You're gone. But I still see, just as Isaac and Ishmael both were blessed, and Ishmael's blessing was pretty good, if Ishmael represents the Jews, then that tells us that the Jews, Israel, God has a blessing left for them. And that's what, I'm, that's what we're doing here. That's why I'm saying, let's compare these two. So in Genesis 27, 27, this is J Jacob's blessing. This is what he got. And he came near and kissed him. And he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Now that part is directly from the blessing that God gave to Abraham. Abraham must have told Isaac, or did, did we read that Isaac, that God said the same thing to Isaac? But anyway, Isaac is saying the same thing now to Jacob, whom he thinks is Esau. But Jacob now has received that blessing. So then Esau comes in after Jacob has left and fled the scene and daddy's sitting there eating the last piece of savory meat he's got in his plate and Esau comes in with a plate of savory meat as what is going on here. And he begins to weep and to cry and Jacob, or excuse me, Isaac realizes what's happened. And so in verse 38, same chapter. Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Now, remember, blessing is a word related to salvation. If you are blessed, that is, a, that is God saving you. If you are cursed... That is God damning you, okay, condemning you. Verse 39, he said, And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. When you look over at Jacob's blessing, that's what you see, the fatness of the earth. Thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of the heaven from above. If you look back in verse 28, therefore God gave the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth. Both of them receiving the dew of the heaven. Now, does anybody know what the dew of heaven represents in the Bible? Anybody? I got 50 cents to anybody. Huh? Guess. You're going to guess. Yep! There you go. 50 cents, that was easy. I ought to carry more quarters in my pocket, get you to study your Bible more. I had a teacher in fifth grade that knew how to manipulate Mike Hoggart. First thing he did after a month in his class is he moved me off the back row and set me right by his desk because I could not keep my mouth shut. They say amen to that. Second thing he did was he had a great big thing of candy and little toys you'd get out of machines you know and he gave out slips of paper with his initials gb gary brown and if you collected so many of those you got to reach in there and get whatever you wanted out of that big jar of stuff and he knew how to, i mean 
We're good. How many, how many GB slips are we getting out of this? He said, I'll give 10 for this one. And boy, we, you know, whatever he asked, we, we wanted those slips. So anyway, I'll start giving hoggy slips. If you answer Bible questions right. Isaac, behold thy dwelling shall, this is again to Esau, thy dwelling shall be the fatness there to do with that. God said in Deuteronomy, he said, behold, my doctrines shall distill as the dew upon the earth. As the gentle rain, okay? Not, not in big torrents, but every day, especially in the summer, you get up and there's just dew on the grass, okay? That God, God did that all night. He just dropped a little moisture down from heaven on that grass. It feeds the bugs, feeds some of the smaller animals. The grass need that little bit of moisture, you know, in dry periods. And they'll take that and store it up and everything like that. And that's how God feeds us, is every day a little bit from... And it comes from heaven. Doesn't, it doesn't come up from the earth. It comes down from heaven. And God said, this is how my doctrine comes down to you. So the more you read this Bible daily, even if it's just a chapter, that's one chapter that God just gently put down in your life. And He fed you that. He gave you that. He came all the way down from heaven. That's His doctrine. So when He's saying here to both Jacob and Esau, He is blessing them with the dew of heaven, with the doctrine of the word of God. That's what he's given them. And if you've got the word of God, you've got your blessing. You've got your salvation. You've got your promises. You've got things that, like I did one day, pointing to things that God promised in His Word and saying to God with tears in my eyes, God, please do that. If you don't do that, I'm dead. I'm not going to make it. And God's still doing those things that I read to Him that day. I pointed to those and I said, God, I need that. He's still doing that. He hadn't stopped. Even in my dream last night, Chris, I was somewhere... Fighting against some British organized crime guys, terrorists. And I didn't have nothing in my hand but a piece of iron. And it was at night and I was going to try to run up on them. And they all had guns and I was going to try to surprise them somehow. But I figured at some point they'll see me and shoot me. So before I ran out there, I'm going, God, have mercy on me. Please forgive me of all my sins. Don't let them kill me. But if they do, please let me go to heaven. And then I took, I beat every one of those guys. I sure did. I beat every one of them. Then I ended up on a boat full of them. I don't know what I was. Anyway, verse 40. And he said, so the dew from heaven above the fatness of the earth. Those are both salvation things. The fat, the dew, and so on. Verse 40, no, he's got a, there's a little thing here with it. And by thy sword shalt thou live. And shalt serve thy brother. Thy brother, now in this case, if we're looking at this as Esau is the Jew, and Jacob are those who are born again by faith, Gentiles and Jews included, then the Jew is going to be under their dominion. Until a certain day comes along. And Paul said, Beloved, and this is part of that mystery that I was preaching on this morning. Paul said, Beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery. That blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. There's coming a time, just like with Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is those who are saved now by grace through faith, the Gentiles who are taken up into heaven without dying. The Israel, the Jews then, are the ones who received the double blessing at that time because they saw him go up. And 
Jacob, or excuse me, Elisha takes the mantle of Elijah and he does what Elijah did. He folds it and he smites the river Jordan and the waters part just like that. And he's going, ooh, I got it. I got his spirit now. And that, to me, that's the same thing. By thy sword thou shalt live and shalt serve thy brother. And this shall come to pass. When thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Okay. In other words, I see this as when God takes us Gentiles in the translation, in the resurrection, the rapture, being caught up that day, that God now has broken the yoke of Israel. And now Israel and their remnant are going to receive that blessing. But they can't receive it until that yoke is broken. Okay? At, not as a people. That, I know some Jews that have been saved. And, um, you know, great people. So God still is saving a Jew here and there. But there's going to come a day when, boom, thousands of them saved by God's grace. And I believe that happens when our dominion here is taken off and lifted and, and that yoke is broken. Uh, look at Romans 9 verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. And here's what God is saying here. Okay, like Roy. Okay. Roy, you didn't know this when you, were, when you had your head in a bottle of Jack. But God had already written your name down in the book of life. And if somebody would have told you gone up to you at the bar and said, Roy, God sent me here to tell you that your name is written in his book of life. And one of these days, you're going to come out of this bottle and you're going to go for the next 70 years and never touch a drink another day in your life. And then he's going to call you home and he's going to use you to be a blessing to thousands of people all over the world. They're, they're just as drunk as you are, right? Yeah. What are you drinking? Give me some of that. I want to live in that fantasy world you're living in. You would not have believed it. But God did. See, God, before... He, he did this on purpose... While Esau and Jacob are still in the womb, he says, before they were ever born, I've already picked one, so that you know that it is not of works that I pick any of them. It is by election. Now, that gets into the idea of predestination. Does God predestine certain people to be saved like the Calvinists believe? But their doctrine is, it's, it's like a train running only on one rail. Okay? It just don't go far. Because the one rail that all Calvinists can only see is the rail of predestination. That God picked you and you are a slave to that. This is why... Uh, John MacArthur has asked the uh, Dewey Lockman Foundation, and they've granted it. He's got a license. Now, Dewey Lockman Foundation publishes the New American Standard Bible. Okay? And they say the New American Standard Bible is the most literal to the Greek and Hebrew. And that's what we need. Most literal Greek to he Hebrew. But you can't do that with languages. You can't be... Ex exactly literal 
and understand it. It'd be like if I would say to you, Jr., what passes? Do you know how to answer that? Okay. If we had a Mexican family come in and say, Hey, Jr., ¿qué pasa? You'd say, Hey, I'm doing fine. How are you? How's it going, eh? See, that's how we would do it. Literally, K pasa means what passes. And that's the literal interpretation of it. Now, we know what they mean by it. How, how, it's a greeting of how are things going? Hope all is well in your life. Okay? And we, we would say it differently depending on what part of the country we're from. But you can't literally translate that and then expect us people to understand that. We, we mean what passes. I'm not talking to you about that. Okay? So anyway, John MacArthur gets a license from the Dewey Lockman Foundation to have a retranslation of the New American Standard that follows his Calvinistic doctrine. First thing he's going to do is take out every reference of capital L-O-R-D in the Old Testament. Because he's smarter than Jesus. He's smarter than all the New Testament Greek writers. And he's going to replace that with Yahweh. Now that is not, that is not his name. It is the Lord. That is his name. That was, that was guaranteed us in the New Testament. Secondly, and this, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. He's taking out the word servant. Paul the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And replacing it with slave. You see, according to the law, and I've taught you this law, a person after paying off a debt is now free, but they can go back and be a free servant. And that's what we are in Christ. The, pay, the day, debt has been paid. We don't owe it. We go to Christ and are free servants. Okay? But MacArthur believes in predestination only and says that as followers of Christ, we did not pick Christ. He bought us and picked us. We are his slaves and we only must do what he tells us to do. And, and in MacArthur's gospel, if there's sin in your life, it is then obvious to him that you are not saved. Because Christ did not command you to sin, thus you've been disobedient, and so on and so on and so on. He ain't right. So he's going to rewrite the Bible to make his Bible fit his doctrine. Ain't how you do it. Um, but that's, that's, he only runs on predestination. The idea of what Peter said, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Now we have the other rail for the train. God picked us because he knew the outcome of every decision we would make. He looked at Pharaoh before Pharaoh ever was Pharaoh, and he saw everything that Pharaoh was going to do. And it's like playing a chess game with a supercomputer. And the computer thinks you're going to move this queen like here. But... And it projects out for all the plays after that. But you don't do that. You move the queen someplace else. Now the computer's got to figure all these other things out because you didn't do what you were supposed to be doing. Well, God knows all your moves, all your chess moves. You'll never win at chess with God. He knows all your moves. He knows all your decisions. He knows how your mind works. He, he knew it all from before. For he said in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He knew it all of that. And he chooses us. He elects us because we did call upon the name of the Lord. And he knew we would. And he knew we would stick with it. Okay? That's how I see it. And to me, that works. That answers all of these questions about are we, do, are we predestinated or did, how does, it, and to me that works. Both, both fulfills the scriptures and does not break. I don't have to rewrite the King James, Chris, to make my doctrine fit. 
I don't think. No, I don't. I promise you, I know. Anyway, in verse 12, he said, It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. And that's what happened. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall, I, what shall we say then? Is there an, And see, you could then say at that Esau represents the children of unrighteousness, the seed of the sons of Belial, the, um, the tares in the field of the wheat. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. He's, remember, he's God. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. In other words, just because you're a Jew doesn't mean I automatically have to have an unending compassion with you. And just because you're a Gentile doesn't mean I can't have compassion and mercy on you. If you're a Jew, I can love you and have mercy on you unless you just hate me and serve other gods. But if you're a Gentile and you love me, I can have mercy and compassion on you if I want to. I'm not sticking myself to just one race of mankind. I'm offering it to the whole lot of them. So then it is not of him that willeth, which meaning us, nor of him that runneth, but of God that sheweth mercy. And when you study the mercy of God, that's a big study. There's a lot in the Bible, especially in the Psalms of God's mercy. When you study God's mercy to those who cry out for it, God's compassion overcomes his judgment and he says, yeah, I'll forgive you. I have children, adult children, that have done things wrong. I, as an adult child, have had to go to my mother and father and confess things and own up to it. I didn't like it, but I did. And I found mercy and I found forgiveness. And as an, a father of adults, or even as children, children, I've forgiven my children. Hardest thing, hardest thing, I would say, is to be a child of a pastor who messes up. And maybe the church might demand church justice. All right, let's throw them out. But my children at different times in different situations have come to me and confessed things. That ain't easy to do. But I tried to make myself throughout their life somebody that they knew would forgive them. And I always do. And I have one now who you have not seen in a while. And uh, he's running. And really this started going downhill this time last year. And God made a promise to me and I'm holding on to that. I can forgive him of everything he's done just as easily as I can get angry at anything he's done. That's being godlike, showing mercy. Showing mercy to people who don't deserve it, but showing it anyway. Hebrews 11, 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence he also received him in a figure. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to God. Did you see what I just read? Did you see what I just read? Did you see what I just read? Did I not say that Isaac blessed Esau? Did I not say that? I said it. Did I say it, Helen? I said it. Looky here. 
By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and who? Esau. Concerning things to come. You both get the dew of heaven and you're both going to get the fat of the earth. And thank God it can now be pork fat. Amen! Pork fat! Bacon! Uh, Hebrews 12, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Why would you want to fail of the grace of God? Lest any, ah, here it is, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And thereby many be defiled. Lest there be, and we read this morning, who's, who is it that brings bitterness? It's the strange woman who offers sins to us that feel good at the time, but are always bitter. Bitter at the end. Right? Every drunk has his hangover. Right? Every, every dope addict has his coming down. And those coming downs are hard. They hit hard. This is verse 16, lest it be any, any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. See, that's what I said. All of us, all of us coming into this life sold away our eternal blessing in God with our first sin. Doesn't matter what it was. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He wasn't going to get Jacob's blessing. Galatians, I threw this in here just to show the compassion. And there's going to be more. Because after Isaac... We're now going to deal with Jacob. And Jacob goes to have a wife, right? Who is his first wife supposed to be? Rachel. Who was his first wife when he woke up from the party? You're the ugly one. You're the dog. What am I doing with the dog? Ugh! And he comes out of the tent mad. Can you believe that? And, and, and this scripture, I think, applies in all of those. And, and you just see it over and over and over. When Judah, Judah, the man, has four sons. The first two, the first one God killed. Uh, the second one died. Now Judah doesn't have an heir and his daughter-in-law is was promised a seed and she knows now that if Judah married now somebody, she'd have to wait 20 some odd years and she ain't going to do that. And, you know, she tricked him and... She got the seed out of him. And it was Zerah, and she has that twin, Zerah and Pharez. And we have the, the idea that it was Zerah who came out first because his hand came out. And they tied that red thing on there, on his hand. But his hand came back in, and Pharez came out. And they called him Pharez because he breached. And so who's the firstborn? Well, the line of Jesus came through Pharez. But Zerah has still got that scarlet thread. Okay? That means something. That scarlet thread, you see it all through the scriptures. The blood of Christ. I love these things. And, and see, here's, it's just God with another story, another story, another story. Teaching us the same idea, the same principle. And it is this, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by bondmaid, the other by free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. 
which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, Hagar. For this Agar or Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is. That's the Ten Commandments. That's the new, that's the Mount Sinai covenant that God made. It said, do these and you shall live. If you don't do them, you'll die. And they all died because they didn't do them and is in bondage with their children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. And that just, boy, that one day that just took me because I'm going, yeah, we do have a mother. It's Jerusalem above. So our, our whole second birth, and th that actually applies in, in our life. The, f the first birth that we had was Esau. We are Esau. We are full of sin. We traded our birthright. We, we sold out everything. And God hates this flesh. Amen? But we had a second birth. And that second birth is conceived by God himself. And it is the inner man, the new man that is in us. And it is, it, it, it cannot be cursed. And it cannot sin. It is guaranteed the blessings of heaven for all of eternity. And it is Esau. It is Ishmael. It is um, Leah, the ugly sister. Okay. It is, uh, yeah, on and on and on. You get that. First birth, God hates it. Second birth, that's the one. That's the one he's looking for. Let's be dismissed. I don't have any emails. Yeah, I got a lot more. But we're done for tonight. Let's see how much. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, we'll get into that next Sunday night. Esau hated Jacob. Ishmael hated Isaac. Right? And even in the two sisters, Rachel and Leah, Leah was the one popping out kids right and left. Rachel, none. Okay? So there's always a hatred. Hannah and Peninnah. Um, in 1 Samuel, Samuel's mother, Hannah. Peninnah is the one that the guy, I mean, she's producing kids, but he don't love her. Hannah's the one he loves. She has no children. Okay? And you just see it all through the scriptures. Father, open up this book to us. Open up our eyes to it, our ears, our hearts. Help us to see, Father, even our very lives in these stories, in these types, these allegories, these pictures you've drawn for us in the scripture to give us understanding of doctrine. And the doctrine is this flesh. You hate it. And it cannot please you. It cannot receive a blessing. It will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Will not. It must be the second birth. It must be Isaac. It must be Jacob. It must be Judah. Father, just, Lord, open our eyes to it. And help us see, God, your work and your handiwork and your work in our lives. And then, Father, we can look at others who are full of sin and say, surely God hates them. And yet, they can be born again and God would hate them no more. So, Father, give us that kind of love to help us see people the way you see them as potential people that could be brought into the kingdom of God. You did it with my brother-in-law. You did it with the worst person I ever knew in my life. And I know you can do it with anybody. Lord, do it. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.